This is one of Europe's oldest and most glamorous ski resorts. Kitzbühel in the Austrian Alps. It's the playground of royalty and the super rich. And these winter tourists contribute around 5% of Austria's gross national product. But if things get any warmer, it's an income that looks like it's literally drying up. High up on the mountain, the snow covers good. But lower down, it's a different story. And the tourists here are unimpressed. We thought, we, yeah, we were sort of surprised. We just experienced it though, like it was just your going slush, grass, muck. You know, he's muck all over his sleeves <laughs> and everything. I mean, um, it's an expensive holiday. You must be a bit disappointed that it's not sort of pretty in Kitzbühel. If stuff. you were to judge it, your holiday on the first day, you'd go home. For ski resorts in the European Alps, this was one of the worst winter seasons on record. Across Europe, hard questions are being asked about what the future holds for winter tourism and what impact global warming will have in the Alps. According to a report by the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, just a two degree increase in temperature would mean a third of all alpine ski resorts wouldn't have enough snow to be viable. Well, right now we are experiencing a uh, very extraordinary winter. I mean, a winter like uh, one we could experience in, in 50 or 70 years time. So this is a very uh, extraordinary, but uh, in a way it gives us uh, an idea of what might happen in, in the future. Bruno Arbig is one of the authors of the OECD study. He says that because of climate change, banks are already refusing to lend money to some of the resorts at lower altitudes. They are thinking about, you know, giving credits to, to, uh, to businesses and usually they are uh, not willing to give new credits uh, for smaller business lower than uh, 1,500 metres. The Kitzbühel village is well below 1,500 metres and until now, the secret to its financial success has been that every year it hosts the most famous downhill ski race in the world, the Hanenkamm. Apart from putting Kitzbühel on the tourism map, the race weekend itself brings in a huge amount of money. We calculated about 30 million euros, which will be brought into the area from outside. <laughs> so just from that, the one race weekend, or the run, one race weekend? In, the, in all this race weekend, yes. It's only this race weekend. According to Michael Huber, if the Hanenkamm doesn't happen, the effects are felt right across the Austrian tourism industry. But this year, the season was so bad that there wasn't enough snow to cover the Hanenkamm run. And it was too warm to make artificial snow with machines like these. Undeterred, the race organisers took the extraordinary step of flying snow in by helicopter. We had three different types of helicopters, but between three and six, seven cubic metres per load. So it's a little drop on the hot stone. <laughs> But a lot, a lot of drops filled the holes. For an entire week, a relay of helicopters carried snow from a nearby mountain and trucks and excavators pushed it into place. From their perspective, it was necessary to do so because they wanted to, to have this uh, world-famous Hanenkamm uh, race. Uh, but from an ecological point of view, it was, uh, it was uh, nonsense. Why is that? Because it's um, very, very expensive. I don't know the final calculation, but our calculations were based on about 65 to 70 euros per cubic meter to be placed on the track, which is a lot of money <laughs> for a race. Presumably that's not something you want to do every year. No, no, no. Is that, yeah. is this year's unusual? Yeah, yeah, we hope this is unusual. All up, the race organisers spent around 300,000 euros, or nearly half a million dollars, shifting the snow. Environmentalists in Austria were furious, and Greenpeace staged a demonstration in Kitzbühel. 
this cannot be the solution. We have to do something to stop climate change and we have to do it very rapidly, otherwise it will be too late. And having these cosmetic tricks like bringing snow with a helicopter, uh, if this is going to be normal in 20, 30 years because there is not enough snow anymore, well, I think that's a very clear sign that we should do something now instead of bringing snow with helicopters and uh, trying to ignore that there's climate change taking place. After all the money spent on preparing the racetrack, Mother Nature had one last trick to play. With just five days to go, a freak storm blew the snow away. We had about 60 to 80 k's of wind speed, 24 hours long, but the problem was 10, 12 degrees plus. Mm, and rain, yeah? Uh, and rain, and the mixture of it was that the snow, which was the, the, the racetrack was ready, was 100% ready, it didn't melt it, it blew away. So it's like, be... like with the hair dryer. After the storm, the Hanenkam downhill race was cancelled. Across the Austrian border, in the Swiss Alps, is the Engadine Valley. Here, climate change means much more than a lack of good ski runs. It's life-threatening. I've come here with scientists from the Swiss Avalanche and Snow Research Institute, who've been studying Mount Schafberg. Like many mountains in Switzerland, it's covered in avalanche fences to catch the snow and to stop it from thundering down the slopes. But much of the mountain itself is actually permafrost, a mix of frozen soil and rock. And like everything else in the Alps, it's warming up. Our scientific understanding so far is, OK, it melts. But we don't really know what's, what's happening with the water then, of, the, of this kind of old ice, where it's going, where it's way. And um, we do not know increased heavy precipitation in summer. So we just have to assume a kind of a worst case scenario that the whole mountain slope can, will calm down. In the village of Pontresina, below Mount Schafberg, they're not taking any chances. That's Mount Schafberg up there behind me. And these huge avalanche dams have been built to prevent bits of Schafberg from tumbling down the mountain and, and flattening the village of Pontresina below us here. And as Schafberg warms up and loosens up, it, it threatens to do exactly that. The barriers were completed three years ago. From the air, you get some idea of just how huge they are. Marcia Phillips, one of the researchers studying Schafberg, is flying me up to the mountain to check its temperature. She and her colleagues have also been testing new types of avalanche fences, and she wants to see how they're holding up. We're dropped off literally on the side of the mountain. But as we climb down the slope, Marcy discovers that one of the fences has collapsed. Um, we can leave heavy stuff up here, yeah. but I want to take my camera because this is amazing. This is incredible. <laughs> Why is it incredible? Because, um, well, because they've been standing here for 10 years and I've been measuring, uh, you know, non-stop for 10 years. Every hour, the temperatures, the, the, the movements every year and everything. And uh, they seem quite stable until the last time I came, and now it's fallen over. So I don't know what's happened. These enormous steel avalanche fences were specially designed to be anchored in moving permafrost instead of solid rock. But this one has been pushed back up the mountain. This uh, support was lying on that concrete there. The problem is, to have um, avalanche dis defence structures, you need to have a stable ground, which we don't have here. We have a creeping permafrost. And the, the long-term aim of this was to observe how they react when the ground moves relatively quickly. The reason the ground is moving is because it's warming up. Here we're at the top of a borehole, which is uh, 20 metres deep, and we have 12 thermometers at different depths 
measuring the temperature of the permafrost. And that also allows us to see the, the thickness or the depth of the active layer, which is the layer which melts in summer. And um, here it's about 50 centimeters, but in a very warm summer, it might be as much as a meter. Well, what's been happening? What's the trend been? Uh, it's been getting warmer. And we had, for example, in, in summer 2003, which was very, very hot here in the Alps, we had an active layer of one meter, which also caused the whole um, slope to creep more strongly. If the mountainside gives way, Hundreds of thousands of cubic metres of rock and ice will tumble down here towards Pontresina. From the top of Schafberg, you can see another obvious sign of global warming. So this is the Mortarach Glacier in the background here. Yeah. And um, it's uh, receding quite rapidly now. Um, I think in 2003 it went uh, back 80 or 85 meters in one year. And is that a bad thing? Well, it's a, an, a very important water reservoir for the Alps and underlying countries. So in the long run, yes, it's a bad thing. This winter, there's no problem driving over the high alpine passes, which are normally closed by deep snow. I'm heading further west to the French resort of Megève. This is Adrien Duvillard, a former downhill World Cup champion and now the director of tourism here. Okay, I'll see you down there. Thank you. It's snowing and he's showing me around the ski runs. This has been his family's home for generations and he's passionate about the risks that Mejev faces from global warming. Now it's no time anymore to, to think about what we should do. Now it's time to do it. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a global problem, it's a world problem. It's not only for a uh, big economy. To reduce greenhouse gas emissions, Adrian is lobbying to have all of the ski lift equipment converted to environmentally friendly biofuels. OK, yes, we are planning for next, not next season, but for the coming years, to change uh, all the fuel we are using for the, for the snow machines, uh, like the fuel, uh, because we want to reduce the impact that we, uh, we, we do to the environment. Faced by climate change, the response from most other ski resorts has been to invest heavily in artificial snowmaking and to build ski lifts higher and higher up the mountains. But Adrian is arguing against a proposal for higher ski lifts here. He recognises that as the climate changes, villages like Mejev will have to diversify by relying less on skiing and more on other types of tourism. 20 or 30 years ago, OK, it was a time to invest. OK, but now it's not time anymore to invest. Now the time is not for um, huge or many things, it's time for quality not to, uh, to show them what we are able to do uh, in getting this place or this place on to be the big cable car. No, I think we don't care about this. I will not change the attitude of my relatives. My, my grandfather had been in the ski racing business. My father had been in the ski racing business. So I will and I, maybe my children will, will do so. And we will not change to table tennis. <laughs> there is quite a change going on. I mean, 10 years or 12 years ago, I mean, ski area operators were very interesting. They wanted to know more about climate change and possible impacts. But uh, for them, you know, it was, it was something very far in the future. Now things have changed because they think it's, it's, not, it's not so far in the future. It's something that, that affects us right now. Do you think that people are worrying too much about global warming, about climate change, are they worrying, is there too much talk about it and too much no, like, not, panic? Or? not enough. <laughs> <laughs> not enough? Not enough for me because, I mean, we have, to, we have to, to, to wake up everybody. If I don't want to close my eyes, I have children and I want to, uh, to, uh, to help them to, to grow in this world. Uh, but, uh, I mean, what we do now, it's not that good. It's time. We are almost too late about this, so we have, we have to do something now.